Welcome to the My Personal Football Coach Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, episode 38 with Keith Bonus. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show. Uh, this week we've got a fantastic guest, uh, someone who's been really instrumental and pivotal in my coaching career and uh, still is, um, still always on the other end of the phone, so I often ring up to, to ask questions about tactical and technical questions about my, my coach, my coaching. Uh, his name is Keith Bonus. Uh, he was uh, or is a FA educator, works for the Football Association as an educator. Uh, he was fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to uh, be my um, level two and level three uh, tutor. Helped me through that. Uh, like I say, a real big, big positive influence on my career. And he's a bit of a local footballing legend, actually, uh, in, in South London and Surrey in particular. And he's, he's really has inspired uh, many coaches, as you'll hear on this on the programme, many coaches who've gone on to work uh, in, in the high high echelons of the game. Uh, he also was uh, one of the pioneers in women's football, was a manager of the Charlton's ladies team, one of the most successful teams um, several years ago. Uh, also um, manager was a manager of Watford ladies as well, which I was fortunate to help out of him as well for a short time last season. And uh, he has a wealth of experience, someone who's worked full time within the game uh, his whole career. So uh, whether you're aspiring elite coach or just someone who wants to work within the game at any level, this really uh, is an episode not to be missed. Uh, and I'm really was you know a, a privilege spending an hour or so in Keith's time and just chatting about football and his experiences working you know at all those levels. So uh, this is really a real good one. If you are enjoying the show and do enjoy the podcast, please do leave a review. Uh, it really does help. I really would appreciate it. Um, uh, thanks very much as well also for all the feedback uh, we're getting for the uh, for the for the e-learning course the my personal football coach uh, 1v1 um, small sided games a ball mastery course uh, getting loads of feedback for it uh, just wanted to share someone actually someone sent me a great message uh, and they asked him to put it down in an audio tape for me uh, uh, philip is a coach from from ireland so here's him feeding back about the uh, the, the level one uh, ball mastery and 1v1 course and and how effective it's been for his coaching I've recently completed the Level 1 Elite Soccer Coaching course with focus on ball mastery and 1v1 practices. In working through the modules, I found again a deeper understanding of how important those aspects are to be included in the training environment, particularly with younger players. Um, the task within each module really helped me focus on how I design my practices, particularly when dealing with those younger players I mentioned. Um, I would highly recommend the course to anyone um, the visuals that are provided within the course in terms of demoing practices um, were brilliant to incorporate into my training environment. So there you go. Like I said, uh, really privileged that people are getting so much value out of that course uh, uh, and uh, people will keep feeding back uh, and, we're, and we're continually trying to develop it and, uh, and bring it on. Like I say, it's just about, you know, 1v1 become really popular now. You know, I've been banging the drum for a long time, but it seems to be now finally getting in vogue again. Uh, lots of people talking about it, but I think it's un important to understand the ideas and the theory behind it and how to set up an effective session. Uh, it's not just about setting up a 1v1 with someone dribbling at a player. 1v1 looks a lot different all around the pitches and understanding a bit about ball mastery and effective use of small-sided games. A uh, big couple of months for me. This is always the busiest time of year, so I'm out to LA next uh, next month in a few weeks. Really looking forward to that. I'm going to try and get down to San Diego as well, working with LA Galaxy out there. Also, um, we got some partner clubs out there, so we're filming some of their players and getting them on the app. Um, you know, if you're interested in a club partnership, how can support player and coach development, just drop us a line and we can set you up a, a free demo. But really privileged again that we've got so many partner clubs from all around the world coming on. You know, this is really is unique. The My Personal Football Coach club partnership really is unique. You know, the only thing that really supports players individually and coaches uh, you can log in and uh, check their usage of your players as well and it really is relatively inexpensive so if you're interested in that drop me a line uh, but yeah really uh, excited to go, go down to LA and then June really is just uh, back in London working with a lot of professional footballers uh, pre-pre-season getting them ready 
um, for the for the new seasons. So that's always the busiest time of year. And then again, July and August, uh, lots of players visiting me from around the world. Uh, lots of young aspiring pros, lots of young players and pros as well. And then building into another trip to Hong Kong in September. So busy few months coming up, uh, but we've got some great new uh, podcasts as well. So keep it tuned. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get into the show. So Keith Bonus, welcome to the show. Thank you. Can you give us a, just a little bit of a brief uh, description of your playing and coaching journey up to this point? You can do that. I'm 60 next week. Um, <laughs> yes. So Brees is tough, question. but uh, as, as a young player, um, I never reached the heights of, of uh, professional level. Um, I broke my leg twice in my teens. Um, so I was at Chelsea Development Centres, they were called back in the day, just trial centres. Uh, and when I broke my leg, I never got back into it. So I was out for a couple of years. Um, when I eventually went back playing, it was at amateur and semi-professional level, which is where my <coughs> career carried on. But coaching wise, um, I was part of a very successful school team, at a school called Barnwell School in Stevenage. Um, and they wanted to stay together when we all left school. So we literally called ourselves Barnwell Old Boys, even though we were all like 16 and 17. And I was the oldest, so they said, right, you're the coach. Uh, but at school, they'd kind of earmarked me for teaching and stuff like that. Um, so I was kind of a natural leader. I was captain of many school teams. So I was happy to take on the, uh, the responsibility. So that's how, that was my first coaching job, management job, if you like. Uh, and that just kind of continued playing and uh, different levels until I moved down to South London in 1986. Um, we won't talk about the different marriages, <laughs> but that was with my second wife. Um, um, I, I took over a business in London. I actually quit playing then. I quit playing at semi-pro level. I was with uh, a club called Nebworth, and I quit playing to take up a business, actually a pub in uh, the Walworth Road near the Walworth Road in. South East London and uh, I got a chance to do the preliminary badge with Millwall while I was there and also while I was there because the customers knew I'd been in football um, we started to kick about over a local park and formed pub teams as you'd call them Sunday league teams that quickly grew to five teams and, uh, and youth teams because of my organisational skills if you want to call it that um, and like I said I did my badge with Millwall uh, Les Reed was my tutor and a guy called Nicky Milo, uh, God, God rest him, um, and they recommended me to go on to do the A licence that year, which was the old advanced licence, not the UEFA. It didn't exist at the time. So I went to Lillishaw, I think, the following year, and then it went from there to the UEFA A in 97, and the rest we're going to talk about in a minute, so I won't go on. Then it reached the pro licence, not until 2012. So an extended journey with lots of experience in between. I didn't rush anything. So what was your first um, coaching job after that school? I mean, so you... Paid. Yeah, your first paid So my first... Sat obviously, I started my own teams in, in, yeah. the, in the pub and, and I actually took those teams into county level. Yeah. I actually bought the lease on the ground, which cost me an awful lot of money. It was a bad move. I actually had to make myself bankrupt. And that's when my, my second marriage collapsed, um, unfortunately, for other reasons as well. Um, but fate's a funny thing. Um, so I carried on with that club and took them as high as I could. wasn't salaried, but my first salaried role was with Tootin and Mitchum. And because I'd been successful in the other level, a player at Tootin and Mitchum that had played for me recommended me to the chairman. They were in trouble. They were in the, the bottom three, I think, of the Ryman uh, second division then at the time. And he just said, I know a guy who's a really good coach. I was uh, an A license at UEFA A and I was county coach for Surrey by then. So I had a good reputation already building up and the chairman took a chance on me and uh, obviously within two years we won promotion to the Ryman Prem. During that time I'd also carried on doing courses and I'd met the women's and girls football development at Charlton Athletic and I became the first I think A licensed coach to become an, uh, a centre of excellence director for girls uh, and everybody kind of looked at that strangely but that was obviously salaried and that grew into being head coach of the successful chart and women's team alongside the two in role in the end I had to give up the two in role because that became too much of a commitment and so when did you because the first time we met was in 2002 I think it was wasn't I did my uh, level two 
with you and you were the coach educator with the FA in Surrey FA. Yeah. So how, how did that role come about? The Surrey County coaching role came about um, through again through a connection. I, I knew uh, a trustee board member of the Surrey FA. Uh, I had previously started coach educating with the Kent FA. I was called in by Darren Hare, who I'd met on uh, on the UEFA A, and I'd been quite successful at that. But I was actually living in Stretton at the time, which was within the Surrey area, uh, and I knew a guy called John Tasker at the Surrey County FA and he knew the role of county coach was coming up. Neil Barth was doing it at the time, but he was going to shortly move on to Chelsea, where he's still at, and they offered me the role. Um, and I took it, and I, I've maintained that for 25 years. So, yeah, you would have been on one of the earlier courses, but not the earliest. No. Um. So what? So uh, tell us a bit about that then. We'll start there, moving in from coaching into coach education. What are the main differences and challenges with that? I'll be honest with you, it came quite naturally to me because I think I had teaching skills anyway. So again, I think where I'd been, uh, again, a team captain in all sports. And uh, when I first did the course myself as a student, it was one of those where I thought, I could do this. What he's doing, I could do this. And I found myself leading the other sessions, even on that course. So where other people were struggling, I was kind of, oh, no, you need to do this. And I was helping people. Uh, and it's... It just seemed a natural thing for me. So there was the difference is obviously because you're now giving out information, and in those days you had to demonstrate far more than we have to now. So I used to enjoy it, and I used to enjoy showing and seeing the results of that. So for me, it, it was a natural thing. Um, so the transition wasn't tough for me. So I mean, thinking back then, um, so I remember our first courses. One was at the actual, was was at Tooting and Mitcham actually on on the Astro turf mm -hmm. there. And you know, and I was thinking about. I th we talk about this a lot because you know, think about all those, you know, all those coaches that you've supported throughout the years. I mean, I mention this a lot. You're still really positive in in my uh, in my coaching life, so I'm always you know ringing you up and badgering you. But I mean, tell us some of the people that you've, you've coached down the years who've come through your courses. Oh God. Who maybe the high profile ones that the, people might. I think know. the highest profile ones that I've I'm, I came into contact with over the years were. Like Sean Dyche, um, did his B licence down in Kent, uh, and at a St George's Park conference, he actually mentioned that his tutor was in the audience when he was being interviewed, and how scared he was when he was <laughs> going to yeah. deliver the session. Um, Chrissy Powell, Dean Kiley. Yeah, that was there on my on my. They they be. both kind of chose through the Charlton link to do it with me rather than go the PFA route. They actually wanted to see how, if you like, the grassroots guys and and the semi pro guys were doing the course. And they both made a conscious decision to come on one that we did at Cobham. And they were star pupils. They were absolutely superb with the other guys on the course. But they they really appreciated it, the other guys as well. But they were just, they were fantastic. Took part in every session, mm -hmm. helped the other guys, really humble. Uh, and yeah, I've stayed in touch with them both since. Um, you know, Christy, through his career, he's gone on to, to obviously manage at, at different levels, been president of the PFA. And Dino's actually goalkeeping coach here at Crystal Palace right now. Not had a chance to meet him yet, um, but uh, that will come. I'm sure he's still in touch with Kopi, my, my wife, who obviously trained with him when she was at Charlton. Um, others, Jason Yule, I, I did him way back on his prelim back at Wimbledon when he was there. and uh, He's currently with England. He's obviously gone through the ranks at Charlton as a coach really successfully. Um, uh, so thinking about then all these... All these young, uh, you know, hungry coaches like myself back at the, back in those days. Mm -hmm. What are the main sort of th what's the main messages you want to get over to them? Obviously, you've got the technical and tactical information, but what are the other key things that you really want to give to the, the new coaches coming in? I through? think there's absolutely no question that your personality kicks in and your own ambitions and the way you portray those ambitions. I think uh, most of the ones that have been certainly been successful are the ones that have that real passion and vocation for teaching and coaching and wanting to give. You know, it's easy to say we all we all want the the financial gain from it. You know, I've got a pro license, but I've never earned anything close to Mr. Guardiola or anybody like that. But I'm really proud that I've got that uh, and the route that I took to get it. So I say, if you've got a passion for coaching and teaching, and you know your biggest reward is always what you give to the people that you teach, and you see where they go from there. So that includes players that I've coached as well as coaches that I've coached. 
I'm absolutely proud of the people that have reached heights and that's people that have come from a real grassroots background. They're either now they're, they're CCDs for their counties or they're coaching at decent semi-pro levels or they've made a career out of coaching. You know, whether it's the highest level or not, if they've made a career out of doing something that they love uh, and I've helped them along that route, then, then I'm happy with that. But I also say to them, when you start giving back as well, you need to be the same with whoever you teach. I want them to kind of, yeah, you could say carry my legacy, but everyone's different in the way that they portray themselves and the way they put things across. But I always instill, don't, don't be too proud, if you like, and always be humble. And even be prepared to regress and go and, go and coach the youngest kids. Mm. You know, I, I never say no. I get friends now, oh, you come and do my under 10s or my under 8s, and, uh, and I'll pay you. I don't want paying. If I've got time, I'll come and do it. And I think you've got to, you've got to be like that. If you love the game and you actually love the rewards of seeing players enjoying what you do, then you've got to be that way. If you're doing it as a task, then I don't think you approach it in the right way. I think this you mentioned there, teaching and learning. So I, I found, you know, after in starting my coaching career with, with you and uh, through that 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 journey, and then going to America and coaching, when I did my teacher training, I found it. I seem to take to it a lot quicker than many other people did because I had that grounding in, in that in 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 that in that field, if you like. It's very similar. Do you mm. feel there is it's really that's important? I think there's a lot of similarities between, you know, teaching there and then and what we and the way we just and the way we deliver to kids on the football pitch. I think it's how receptive you are to to being taught yourself, because not everybody's academic. Not everybody's capable of learning at the same speeds. We know that whether it be academics or playing, it, it, it's irrelevant. I think there's quite a few of the guys that I've taught have gone on to be i.e. coaching teachers like yourself or they're coaching coaches and, and they're all doing well at it and I'm proud of that fact and I like to think that something I triggered in them is what's caused that ability to, to we always say stay open minded it's a cliche but you have got to stay open minded to, to learning because everything changes every day in this game yeah. and, and the years I've been in it the goalposts have moved so many times that uh, you get dizzy, but if you're a, a, if you're talking about coming out of maybe educational teaching into football, coaching teaching, of course there are strengths you can take from one to the other, but it's like saying a, a top top player can automatically become a good mm. coach manager. It's not automatic. There's still an element of learning yeah. and how to cross over those bridges. But what, what I mean is that I, I found that that basis I had helped me. You know, hit the road running, as it were, mm. in terms of going into a classroom with a lot, lots of young children in there. And, oh, absolutely, and, no, know, no understand I understand that. that. So that was really powerful. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. interesting to think now. I mean, talking about teaching and learning and how the how the games change slightly, or some perceptions of the game in terms of how we teach young players in terms of game-based stuff and stuff like that. That's a big controversial area. What's what's your thoughts on this and about and thinking about how things were and how things are now and how things have evolved. In, well, as I said, football. I think the goalposts have changed that many times. You get dizzy, I and mean, you talk about all the different methodologies now that have obviously gone through the youth awards here. Um, okay. Yeah. If you look at like the youth awards here and, and uh, the different, you talk about constraints coaching, Ben Bartlett's expertise in that area. Um, even the message we're trying to get across now on all the licenses, the different types the foundation phase coaching, age group relevant. I think it's always been there. But I think they've made more of a, a point of trying to make it more specific now so people really do understand it. But despite all of it, you know, I still travel around and I see a lot of different areas of coaching and I'm still seeing bad practice. Yeah. I hate using the terminology we normally use, but it is. It's bad practice. You still see adults join. I watched the other night. Two big guys joining in an under-12s game. Proper tackles smashing the balls as hard as they could in a little eight-a-side game on a pitch next to where I was doing an in-situ visit on a B licence. And it was scary. I actually filmed a little bit of it so I could show the coach I was teaching and make sure he never does it. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, if you look at Pete Sturgis' stuff, I think he's, he's being highly revered and rightly so. I think wherever he goes, he gets a big audience. But that's his mannerism and his personality coming across as well. It's not just the sessions he's putting on. It's about how you deliver, yeah. and that is, you know, that is the bottom line. There are millions now, more than thousands of training sessions online in books. You, if you can't find a training session relevant to what you want to teach, then something's wrong. 
but it doesn't matter you go and find in that session it's still how you deliver uh, and you recognize who you're coaching now, if you're lucky enough to differentiate between age groups and who you coach then you've got to be that and I've always used the words or gummage syndromes you may well remember I don't know but or the schizophrenia you've got to have a different head for every job mm. now, if you're one of those that's in a one age group <coughs> job then maybe your job is not so difficult but where you're bouncing between age groups ability levels certainly as I've had to do in my career a great number of times and, and even the genders then you've got to know which head to put on for that particular training session on that particular day and sometimes you might forget but in general if you can remember it's a different approach whoever it is you're coaching because of the demands of those those levels and, and your knowledge of those those players then you've got to remember to put that right head on and I think that's the biggest skill for any coach to learn right now. I suppose that's quite powerful isn't it I think if you you know 99% of the coaches out there who are trying to make a living in the game maybe haven't had that career at the highest level but you know, and, and working at you know, as I did working in the foundation at Tottenham First, working mm -hmm. with different age groups, disabilities, you know, every, all, you know all, all throughout the range. How important do you think that is in terms of, uh, you know, creating that experience and, and that, that picture for a coach and all those experiences are? How powerful is it's that? It's massive. So it's massive. And, and you know yourself, I put, as much as I get, it gets frowned upon sometimes, I did put a tweet on recently which kind of hinted that people try and rush through the qualifications <coughs> without being that person and again I made a conscious effort of not rushing through so I literally I started coaching at amateur level bottom amateur level and I, I was again like I said I'm prepared to coach little kids I'm prepared to coach big kids I'm prepared to coach adults women I've coached disabilities I work for Mencap uh, I deliberately kind of went around the world I went over to Holland I went over to Spain to watch people watch different coaching styles I was then obviously lucky enough um, in 2009 to get across to Estonia in a role that allowed me again to be part of the UEFA development programs where I was available to visit most countries in Europe and look at some of their coaching methods and none of it was rocket science none of it was that vastly different but everywhere I went it was more about even I found myself looking at the the style of the coach rather than the content of the session Mm. so the coaching style for me is key and even things as simple and I've, I've put it even in the kids books that I've written one of the big lines is body language and I stress it to most people I coach and even I've watched a few sessions in, in recent weeks where you know, the coach is in coaching under 10 kids and he's standing on the touchline with his arms folded or his hands in his pockets those are little things but players pick up on that and it's a massive thing for me so Again, it's that enthusiasm maintaining it. Even if you've had a bad day, and when you go, you've kind of got a duty of care when you go out and coach, whether you're being salaried or not. If you've taken that responsibility, then you've got a duty of care to go and be that enthusiastic. Role model isn't really the right word, but it's that motivator for those kids that you're coaching. No matter where they come from, what language they speak, how big, how small. Uh, and that's something I think I've kind of been good at and I've tried to always put that across to the coaches that I've taught it's quite someone has mentioned that someone said that to me a while back said you know if you're turning up to a session and you're not really excited about putting it on you know then maybe then you know you've got to think about a different career I suppose because you know we're blessed yeah. to be uh, and it can happen let's face it it can happen if you had a bad day at home and as life goes on and you go through the the, the turmoils and, and the problems that everyone has in life it's very easy to sometimes take that to work yeah but I think in, in our role, uh, when you're, again, you're dealing with somebody else's life, they're, they're basically their life's in your, in your care for that period of time. You can't transfer that negativity to them. And no one's perfect, you, you still might do it. I'm sure I've done it. I'm sure I've done it over the years I've been coaching at times. But you kind of stop and check yourself and go, hang on. But that's also when you need people alongside you that's when you need the right support mechanisms around you, yourself, and people that you can talk to. Mm. Uh, and yeah, a lot of people call me and talk to me, but sometimes I need to talk to somebody as well. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm lucky in fact that I've got a footballing wife uh, who kind of understands the feelings in the game. Um, but there aren't many peers that I can call on at this moment in time, because mm. they're either unfortunately no longer with us or, or they're, they're far too busy. 
but that's why I try and make myself available to any of my former students or players that, that want that that mechanism. And it's quite an, it's quite a unique uh, industry is football itself. Whether you're working at a club full time or like majority of us have several different hats as you talk about it. Le everyone's you know got most people have seven different coaching jobs they're doing and that's what you're talking about. So, you know, it's a very busy you know if you want to try and make a career yeah, in it. Yeah. So often you're, you've got several different part time positions you know working towards a full time one. So it's about trying, I suppose, like coping mechanisms to try and deal with that. You know, we've talked about this a lot with yourself, you know, dealing with that stress and that hectic, like, you know, mm -hmm. all those different things going on. What would your, you know, how would you support young coaches and, you know, try and deal with that? I think it, it, it's obviously time management because it's like anything, if you're taking on too many roles, you're probably going to be good at some and crap at others. Or you're going to be okay at some, expert at one, and struggling with the other one because you you're overdoing it and stretching yourself and I've been in that position and that's when it's worried me um, am I giving my best to every single one that I'm working with so I do think it's about balance and it's about life balance mm. and the one thing you do learn as you get older um, without being morbid when people start getting ill and, and you start losing people in, in your life you then start state back well your life and your family is still the priority and some of us are without a doubt guilty of neglecting our families um, when we're going through those kind of career areas. We put that first and we focus on that and it's very easy to neglect the people that you love. And I know I've been guilty of that. It's probably cost me things in my life. Um, but as I said, fate's a funny thing. It kind of has worked its way round. Um, but the advice would always be to pace yourself and, and I do get questions like that and one you just ask me I get coaches how do I do this I need to make money I need to mm. do this but I really want to do that you know the reality of the world especially in this country is that the the opportunities may not be here and, and what I'm quite adept at doing uh, is saying well explore further afield like I did you know the Estonia thing was a lucky one for me in a sense but I didn't hesitate when I got the opportunity it was like, if I don't do it, I'm going to regret it. Yeah. Um, and as I said, even when I was younger, I still, I, I did the, the US thing, I did the camps and all that, but, you know, I know there's people over there now in America that, even my age, that started that way and ended up going over there full time. Mm. And they live there now, you know, yeah. they're US citizens, they live their lives there. And there's even guys that have gone to Europe, Sweden and places like that yeah. and, and ended up staying. So, you know, I've said to people, if you get that opportunity, go for it because I suppose that, that would be a lot, of, a lot of questions I mean you must get asked that a lot people ask me in terms of on social stuff is that how do you get a foot in the door you know foot in the game I want to work want a career in, in football so I suppose you know that's the thing I suppose I, you know so I kick, trying yeah to I kicked the door down <laughs> I had to kick it down you know I, I came from a as I said in the end I came from a grassroots amateur background and it, again it, but it was a reputation that I managed to build uh, including even getting into the coach education because somebody recognises something in you and by putting yourself out there it might be in your mind it might not be what you want it might be considered menial it might be considered you know I don't know I'm going to say below you but I've never ever considered anything below me and I think people recognise that and and then you get those offers and I, you know every job I've had has been somebody coming up saying you know, we think you're the person that could do this. Would you be interested? There's very few of uh, the jobs I've actually got where I've had to to kind of I don't know, go through the real strict uh, interview routine. So it's always been somebody's kind of headhunted me or mentioned yeah. it to me. It hasn't mean I haven't gone through due process when I've actually applied for the job, which I have, you know, including this one. But you know. This one was mentioned to me a year and a half ago, current job I'm in. Estonia was mentioned, would I like to go as an assistant coach, the David Beckham Academy. Um, and Ted Dale was in charge, you know, he, he knew me from coach education, but he said, oh, we're looking to improve the coach education program at the Beckham Academy, would you be interested? That's where most conversations mm. start because you've had some kind of contact in the past, not necessarily a friend, yeah. but they've recognised some of your strengths when they've met you. But that's very so, much the football industry, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, that's, um, absolutely. I suppose, so your advice would be try and network, get out there. And I've said to people anyway, look, you, 
it's, it's about networking, but you still got to be good at what you're doing, hard working, and your your work. Yeah, it's no good yourself. going to network events and then sitting in the corner, you know. And and even getting out to things like you know, obviously you've been out and presented now, but even getting out to things like the the thing in Geneva, yeah. uh, and the conferences that St George's Park do put on. People, are like, oh, what am I going to that for? Well, you're going, you're going for an opportunity to maybe just have that conversation. Yeah. Uh, and there's an event running here, as you know, uh, next week. That I think I'm a guest speaker at, uh, and that guy has done that for that specific reason. Is it gives people a chance to come together on a night when maybe they're not actually working. So he's clock that one and put it on so on a Sunday evening. That's soccer social. Yeah. So we're talking about here. It's and, great and, event in and I've been to, to one and there was you know, 100 people there and then yeah. between the speakers people are coming up and saying hello, who are you? Yeah. People you've never met are coming up and having a chat with you. Uh, yeah, I, I presented one of those as well and yeah, I was really great it's amazing the event. Yeah. I'm a big yeah. uh, supporter of that, that event. So, no, I think, you know, the more you do the better and you can't, again, you can't get and be at everything but uh, Everything's so alive now on the on the web and social media. It still never replaces getting face to face with somebody, going and shaking hands with somebody, mm. and letting them see the real you. Because if you take, uh, you make up a an image of somebody based on social media, which is quite easy to do, or or, or in hearsay, then that could be very very far away from the true image. Yeah, uh, and I think you know most people find that with me that. Uh, Sometimes think I'm this uh, miserable, horrible, mean so and so, but uh, actually when they get to meet me, they realise it's not true. So, so then moving on, because I'll get through the uh, plethora of uh, different positions you've had in world football. <laughs> Just a, let's talk a little bit about Charlton Ladies, because that's a real pivotal part of your mm -hmm. industry, part of your career, and I remember back then as well. Let's talk a little bit about then, you know, what was that like at the time? I mean, people, obviously the women's game is going for a boom time now. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, what was it like back then though? Uh, again, I was the apart from um, Ted Copeland, who was up in Durham. I was the first male A license coach, I think, to step into that kind of area. And uh, I was doing the Girls Centre of Excellence, and and then I'd, I'd met Pauline, who was then goalkeeper for England and goalkeeper for Croydon Ladies. And, and I won't go through the politics of what happened in the end, but obviously Charlton Athletic took over Croydon Ladies, and at the time I was on the coaching staff was the manager from Croydon uh, or the, the assistant manager stayed and was the manager at the start um, but eventually the, they they departed and they asked me to step into the role which I did and I think I had three different assistants while I was in the role for around seven eight years um, but again I actually found it because I already started with the girls program and I'd coached some girls out in the states I actually didn't find it that difficult soon started to realise there were emotional differences but again I deliberately went to a, a conference that I was made aware of at an event run by the Amateur Football Association where Anson Dorrance was going to be a guest speaker who's obviously one of the highest level yeah. female coaches in the States so and he did a, a, a good talk on how you deal with that emotional side of things so again I was already looking to educate myself um, and obviously I'd, I'd, I'd met Pauline and she had run, give me the rundown on almost every different thing that could or couldn't happen um, with players. But it was a case of uh, educate on the job, um, learning by doing. Um, but I found it uh, really, really rewarding. Obviously, at the start, I was doing tooting as well. So I was doing tooting and Mitchum two nights a week. Charlton Ladies the other two nights. Tooting and Mitchum on a match day Saturday. If we were playing Doncaster or Sunderland, I was getting on the train straight after the tooting game to go out and meet the girls who'd gone up on the bus. Uh, so my weekends were completely gone. I was getting home at like gone midnight on a Sunday morning and then back to, to work on a Monday. So again, I was Football in life. totally engrossed in, yeah. in everything. And I was still doing coach education courses as and when they came up. But yeah, it, it is my life. Like, Copy always says I'm going to die on a football pitch. I hope not too soon. I, I wouldn't begrudge myself that. Um. <laughs> so to talk about back at the time, and my recollection is that you it was very much it was Charlton and it was Arsenal ladies. They were the big, you know, the two big times, and you had a bit of a rivalry going on there, didn't you? Talk yeah. a little bit about that. What was yeah, that well, it wasn't just Arsenal. It also, it was around Doncaster the time Bells, when Fulham right. came in as well with with uh, with Fired, he came in and pumped four million into the women's game just at Fulham. So, yeah, the initial uh, rivals of Arsenal was a lot of our players were former Arsenal players who had been involved with Arsenal. Right. Um, so there were some real close games every time we played and they still dominated because they had that little bit extra and they could attract the top, top 
latest players, if you like, because um, they were the only club really not giving salaries, but they were giving them jobs and they were giving them kit and expenses, getting the chance to meet Thierry Henry and Bergkamp. And yeah. That was their selling point, uh, and they had a, a fantastic squad. But we built a squad that could at least give them a game. You know, they never enjoyed playing us. You know, no disrespect to Vic Akers, who, who I get on with really well. If we did ever give them a game or beat them, it was always because we were more physical, not because we were the better football team. Yeah. Um, but we had some quality, quality technical players in our side, uh, like Farrell Williams and Arthur Pond, and, and these were real technical players still playing now to and this some day. Of the, and some of the, those players gone on to manage, right? In the club. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Casey Stone is the one. I mean, Casey was an Arsenal player and couldn't break into their side um, as a youngster, so after being let down a few times she came to me um, I made her captain very very quickly could see that in her um, and cut a long story short around 2005 she was going to quit the England setup because she couldn't break in there she was so determined to be the best the fact that she couldn't really frustrated her and she nearly went bang I'm not going to play for, for the, the manager at that time um, but I said, you're, you're not getting away with that, you're sticking in there, girl, because one day you're going to captain that side. And obviously she went on to captain England and Great Britain. Wow. Um, but there's so many players that, that were of that quality, you know, including Kobe, for me, one of the, the top keepers in the country. Um, so how was probably that in then? the world. How is that so, working with uh, coaching your wife? <laughs> uh, listen, Kobe's such a strong character, she didn't need a lot of coaching. Yeah. She's such a, a dominant figure and determined uh, person in life as well as in football. She didn't need a lot of coaching. She was a leader, even if she wasn't the team captain, which she was a few times. She would lead from the back. and Her best season was probably conceding around eight goals, purely and simply she controlled the team in front of her with her, with her voice. Yeah. Um, such a massive presence. So... But, uh, the, the rivalry with Arsenal was ongoing, but then as a Fulham broke in, he put four million in. They brought over the Norwegian gold medal winning half of that team came over, and then he took uh, all the best players from all the clubs: the Rachel Yankees, the Rachel Units, from Arsenal, from Everton. Uh, tried tried to nick a couple of miles, but to be fair, didn't. They never ever took one of our players, uh, and I always say that's testament to the spirit we had. You know, we had players that they would have certainly loved, but they made offers to Casey, for instance. But she was loyal, and she respected the, the opportunities I'd given her and the help I'd given her, and she wouldn't go. Um, so that was uh, again quite a humbling time, and and we, you know, we gave them a game as well, even though they were as good as they were. I think we drew three three with them at their ground. We were the first team to take points off of them when they got into the the top league after they'd smashed the leagues below. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was quite a sing song in our dressing room that night. Some of it I can't repeat. <laughs> but I, me- I remember quite one passionate. One, I remember one um, post-match interview you did after you won the cup, one of the cup finals against Arsenal, and you were talking about uh, Wickham Wanderers that would have been the well, league maybe, cup final. Won the league yeah. cup final, and you were talking yeah. about you know maybe you know you'd had so many attempts, you tried so many times, and sometimes you questioned yourself. Yeah. And but you know, so talk a little bit about that that process and, you know, I and think what, how. I f- think if you fail fail at the same thing more than once, it's like making a mistake, the same mistake. You always question: Are you capable of of learning and capable of improving? And I would never blame the players. But what I would then look at is my influence on the players. So at that point, I'm questioning: Could I? could I influence the players any, any more than I've already tried to do because I felt, I felt I'd done everything I possibly could obviously alongside the staff that were with me at that time um, but you're leading the staff as well so the, you know, the buck stops with you so when you haven't won it X amount of times you, you do ask yourself those questions it's like if you're on a losing streak at a club you'd start saying you know, which element of this is me is it me and if you're not honest enough to at least consider that, then again, you're in the wrong game. Mm. Uh, you could say, is it uh, feeling sorry for yourself and you want someone to come and it's not you? Uh, and just a little quote I just heard recently when uh, QPR sacked Steve McLaren, that one of the players, he went into the dressing room, the players said, Gaffer, it wasn't you, it was us. Well, it probably wasn't meant patronisingly, but I'm not sure that McLaren would have really took any credit from that or, or gone well thanks very much for telling me that it's a little late bit now. late you know it is your job to be that leader and, and sometimes you have to take responsibility if that means either resigning 
or, or getting the sack, you have to take that on the chin. The, the resignation thing is a tough one because the moment or the timing that you're doing that, you don't want to be considered as somebody that quits and walks away. Yeah. And that's something I've pr prided myself on that I've never quit and walked away if I've really believed I could change it. So when you make those kind of decisions, you have to know 100% you've come to the end of the line in that situation. Uh, and that's really only happened to me once at an amateur level, not at any other level. And I've either been forced out through circumstances or you know, I've made the decision based on principles. Uh, and I won't name the clubs that that happened at. But. So then, um, so then moving on then, because I want to get as much as possible here from you, from your long career. Talk about then your, the, Estonia, the Estonia job. Uh, you, you talked about the importance about going abroad, trying something, trying mm -hmm. new, how important was that? Uh, how, what was that like, having to, to make that trip into the unknown? And then what was it like being out there working with those, those uh, women? Majorly tough decision at, at the time because I knew that um, my wife wouldn't come with me. She was in a, in a very good job working for the, uh, the Metropolitan Police. And obviously because you don't know what's going to happen, you don't want her to, to uproot and give up your home. So the decision was made that I would go. It was an offer of a three-year contract initially. Um, again, before I got offered the job, ignorant to the fact that even Estonia existed. So I obviously had to do some research on it, where it was, a bit of the history on it, so I did that. And the weather conditions were quite scary on paper. Um, but it was an offer that I could not refuse, like I said, knowing that I'd regret it if I did, because I had driven myself to want to be an international manager. I'd applied for the England women's job here uh, more than once. Um, and the latest kind of application processes did say that you know you need international experience as well as either you have a pro license. Um, I didn't have the pro license at the time and I didn't have international experience. So when this opportunity came up to get some form of international experience, bang, I had to say yes. I did have the discussions with my wife, but she knew me and she knew uh, my ambitions. So she heavily encouraged me to go, even though it was probably breaking her heart. And the night that I left to fly over there was probably one of the toughest nights in my life because she was in floods of tears on the doorstep. I think she believed she might never see me again um, because I was going over into a country that reputation was uh, uh, three women to every man. <laughs> and uh, well, she's, uh, she's thinking I'm going to meet somebody over there because I'm going to be away from her. So it was really tough. Um, and when I arrived over there, it was freezing cold. It was in January, it was about minus 10. They put us in a really kind of, the first night in a cold hostel, the room was cold, TV didn't work. And I laid on the bed crying, thinking, bloody hell, what have I done? And obviously the next day we were taken into the stadium, did the press conference and they showed me the apartment that I would be living at, which was half decent. Uh, and I felt a little bit more comfortable then. I thought I can bring my wife over now. Um, and yeah, it kind of kick-started from there. But the the initial phase was going around and watching, so I went to watch games in, again, minus eight, minus ten. Girls completely clothed head to foot, but playing on pitches with ice patches and not blinking about it, playing, tackling, passing, moving on pitches that over here there'd be an 0800, no win, no fee claim for if anyone slipped over. But they, it was just... That, that was their culture uh, and again the first few weeks were just getting to know players running trials different age groups realizing that I'd have a very very tiny pool of players to select a national team from there was only 400 girls playing in the whole country women and girls and it's only 1.25 million population anyway but you know the quality and the standard was was really low apart from one or two individuals that had ventured uh, overseas or really pushed themselves again ironically playing with boys mm. when they were younger um, and more so the the russian girls because there's a 25 percent russian population so they were the they were kind of the tougher characters at first uh, it was one or two of the estonian girls that uh, had done the same so we kind of earmarked a, a national team group then we started coaching the younger ones the first under 17 training session probably 20 girls that were anywhere close 
uh, to that age came to a trial and I think only one of them could juggle a ball more than once at wow. age 16. So I looked at the guy I was working with at that time and I said, we're going to have to go a long way back here. So we literally, our thought process went back to 10 year olds, uh, the level we would have to start coaching. So we started to put in a, a curriculum and a program where we were starting with basic technical stuff, like mm. the stuff you did about. So yeah. we spent a hell of a lot of time doing individual work with a ball, with a ball, turning, dribbling, mm. passing, working in pairs. Did weeks and weeks of it, and we finally got it up to a level where we felt we could go and go and compete. And within a year, we we built it up quite well, and the local. Uh, countries Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia all take part in what's called the Baltic Cup it's at senior level also at youth level so we played in all of those and we won all three um, wow. which hadn't been done I don't think uh, before and uh, so we were chuffed by that but yeah I could go on forever on this subject into the first World Cup qualifiers but I don't know what else questions so, so you like, so, so you're head of all football in women's football in Australia called yeah. girls and women's in football Estonia, in Estonia in Australia I wish it was a bit warmer it's my uh, baby yeah. brain so all, all the f women's football in Estonia yeah uh, so, for instance, the national team. How often did you have contact with the with the with the first team? The Initially, team? it was only kind of uh, once a month, but we we actually insisted on bringing them in once a week. Such okay. a small country, we were able to do that. Yeah. Um, some of the, the the small group of clubs weren't always happy with that, but we felt that needed to happen. So we started running weekly or bi-weekly sessions, weekly with the seniors. So weekly with the seniors and uh, bi-weekly with the youth teams um, because we just felt we needed that contact time yeah. and you know yourself that contact time makes like repetitive and makes habits form so we felt that was a real important factor so that's the way we went. And then what was the, I mean what are the main cultural differences between working with the women in South East London and, and the women in Estonia? Again, I think my background in women's football obviously helped, um, and it wasn't that different. The biggest issue there was more the parental um, viewpoint over there, because they a lot of them really didn't believe that girls should be playing football, right. and I think that's the problem that the girls faced, so they weren't being supported by their families. So I over here, if you, you had a girls game, all the parents would be there watching, over there, maybe one parent, if you were lucky, would even pay attention. They deliver them to you, and then just go away, and come back and get them later, and that included at senior level. So if I, I gave a 16-year-old a debut against France in, in Le Havre in front of 10,000 fans, if that was my daughter, I'd have swam over there. But the parents weren't even interested. So that wow. you're kind of dealing with that mentality. So psychologically, to tell the girls, you know, I'm here for you, um, and this future is possible for you, that was that was a real tough one, um, to convince the girls that there was a, a future in football for them, potentially, and if they got themselves to the right level, they could actually move away from Estonia as well and play, and that's one of the success stories for me. Uh, and then I also got, through my assistant coach there, who was a, a female coach called Catherine Garner, she was a, a master's sports science degree holder, she went through the badges, she also did the pro license, same time as me and uh, she helped me massively along the way there uh, with the coach education side so I worked with her in that as well so we actually developed a mindset in girls there where they believed they could be better than Estonia almost uh, better than being in Estonia where there was no payment for playing and it was a totally amateur game so in the end we've got even now I think there's still three four girls playing in Finland there's four girls playing in Italy, there's one who's been in Hungary for the last six, seven years in the top team there. Uh, a couple went out and did scholarships in the States, one's now a, a coach at Maine University in America um, and one's playing um, in Cyprus uh, and they're, they're in salaried positions. Yeah. They never would have dreamt of that uh, when I went, so for me those are really success stories. And we also qualified over 60 female coaches during the time I was there. There was only one female coach when I went. Wow. So, yeah, there's a lot of success stories. And, and what about day-to-day -day life for you? The, uh, you know, the, the boy, f the boy from, from uh, South London? <laughs> well, I didn't, I, you know, I'm ashamed <laughs> to say, I didn't, I didn't learn the language. Um, very difficult language, apparently almost as difficult as Mandarin. 
Chinese. Um, I learned the terminologies, so colours, numbers, football terminologies. Uh, say hello, how are you? Goodbye, thank you. Um, enough to, to kind of chop. Um, but I never got lessons. I, I could have gone to private lessons. Um, they did supply a teacher. There were some German coaches there. They supplied a teacher for the German coaches, but they never bothered going. So then the FA cut that opportunity, so I didn't get it. So I tried to learn as much as I could listening and watching, but you know we're put to shame by the fact that they all speak English. Mm. And they did, English is mostly their second language. And it's also the way that the Russians and Estonians conversed in general. They'd speak English to each other. Um, although some could speak either parts of the other language. So, you know, I didn't have to, to work hard at that. Um, so it wasn't a major barrier. And but what was but it, I mean, on a it? daily living basis, I mean, yeah. I obviously lived in an apartment on my own. Um, but Pauline being in the job she was in was able to come over for four days, five days at a time during shift patterns. I was able to fly back um, for kind of a week at a time here and there. And, you know, in truth, and she'll, she'll say it as well, it probably enhanced our relationship because the time that we did spend together was absolute top, top quality. And, and I went over in 2009. We'd been together as a couple for probably about nine years at that point. And in 2010, we got married. So I came back that first year and proposed around Christmas time, and we got married that year. Um, and we're still together now. She's we're at 20 years now, I think this year. So something's worked. Essentially, so I mean, as a, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, but there's this sort of saying within the football industry, you know, that the divorce is part, of, you know, comes with the comes with the territory, especially working within full time, uh, within the football, working with many many hats on. So how, what do you do to, you know? Come, come back that and uh, well, make quality time for the for your loved ones. I, I think again, it, unfortunately, it's a lesson that you can learn the hard way, and that's what we said earlier. I try now and try and say to people, look, your your personal life, you've got to make time for it. You've kind of got to set aside days in your calendar where you're going to say that's for us. I guess I'm really lucky in the fact that Pauline was a, a top player. She committed all of her life to football as a player, so she never had any social life. She didn't drink, she didn't smoke. Um, she sacrificed weddings. She was meant to be godparent to her, her nephew, but the, the day that they were gonna get him christened was on a match day. No chance, she's playing in the match. So she understands that mentality. So I was lucky in that sense. Where it's hitting me is now, um, as we're older. And like I said, seeing some people pass away, and and you know we don't want to lose any more time together. So we haven't had a holiday for three years together, proper holiday, apart from a week I think. So this year we've already booked three weeks away uh, wow. in November because um, we've got a, a timeshare. So we've we've made that th this year that we're going regardless. You know, even if it means giving up a job or getting the sack from a job, we we booked it flights are booked it's paid for we're going yeah uh, and we owe that to each other um, as I said I'm 60 this year and it's our 10th one anniversary next year so you know we owe it um, but yeah for youngsters that are juggling plates just be careful you know and you do have to have partners and, and family that do understand uh, that's your job and that that is your passion but you as an individual have to sit and reflect and, and just be careful and, and what means most to you and I know that you're a new dad and I'm sure you're doting on the, on the little one and, and I know you make time for that uh, but yeah anybody else if you need that advice just just be careful and don't let don't let it overtake uh, what should be the priorities in your life and that's well, the people you love it's funny cause when I was uh, like the, when I was, uh, the, the, the decision to leave Chelsea was one of the hardest ones I've ever made but because I was had, had my academy role and I had my two football businesses and I remember one day I was turning up to, to Cobham with two different trainers on and, you know, boss looking at me and saying, what's, what's, you know, and because I, like I said, it's just too much and then that, that was mm. my decision as well, thinking, you know, at some point you need to try and start a family that. and you may think, you know, what are the priorities I need to yeah. actually think about, you know, what's life. It goes back to that again, are you then giving quality to the people that are employing yeah, you or exactly. well, that the was jobs my that you've undertaken yeah. and, and the minute you're not giving, you know, that quality, you really, to be fair to yourself, to be fair to them and have yeah. respect you've got to kind of go, well, maybe I need to, to give something up. And even to be fair, when I was 
you know, as you know, I was doing Barking Abbey. I'd already made a, a subconscious decision to give that up, mm. whether this role would come up or not. So I, I actually was going to take some time out and just do the coach education yeah. and uh, the car shorten yeah. role, um, which would have given me some breathing space. Probably the mistake I've made is that I didn't take that break in between because this, this yeah. job needed to be um, stepped into fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, so currently, yeah. you're currently just currently your uh, what's your t job title now? Coach development manager here at the Palace of Life Foundation. At Crystal Palace and the Foundation. Look, yeah. And there's so many. You're working at Carl Shorten as well. You work at Carl Shorten. Yeah, head coach and technical director. The player manager there is a guy called Peter Adonai. Yeah. Um, again, ironically, he's also. I'm mentoring him on his B licence yeah. and I'm his in situ tutor. A fabulous guy. Um, massive potential to go higher. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed working with him. Um, yeah. Very, very different character. Um, in the dressing room as well as his coaching ability it's really impressed me and hence I've stuck it out so it's just over a year now um, obviously we won promotion last year sorry and uh, and this year you know the, the chairman probably would have been happy with a mid-table finish but we're now just broke into the playoff spots and we've got three games left I think if we win two yeah. out of three we're guaranteed a playoff position which again will be another challenge but We'd probably, um, I wouldn't say overachieved, but we've done more than people would have been expecting or, or happy with. So then talk a little bit about, so you finished in Estonia, and then what, what did you do, what was the, what was the your next role? When I first that? came back, uh, I struggled, to be honest. I couldn't, couldn't get a job, and, and again, I was contacted by somebody connected to Watford. Uh, their ladies' team were in uh, turmoil. They were, uh, they'd lost their manager, they were dropping down the league and somebody knew that I wasn't doing anything. Again, a guy called Carl Lingle, whose uh, partner is Sean Williams, who used to play for Arsenal ladies but played for me as well at Charlton and, and ended up was a manager at Watford at one stage. And then I got contacted by the general manager at the time and I met the, uh, the, her line manager and they asked me would I help them out. So I did. And I went in, the, in there under... Um, conditions that you know I would try and settle the ship which I did very quickly brought in players brought in an assistant coach that I trusted attracted some of my older players and came in we did that um, and we were, we were moving forward um, and I'd hoped to take them into the to the WSL but unfortunately the club decided against that um, and because that was kind of the agreement that I'd made um, I, I chose to walk away from that position at that time I didn't walk into another job straight away, but ironically, after I'd made that decision, again, goes around, old oh, Keith's not working, Keith's available, and somebody called me and spoke to me about the Barking Abbey role. And again, that really attracted me. It was a strong program. So just the Barking Abbey, yeah. just tell, us, tell the listeners what that is. Barking Abbey was a post-16 girls' academy. Yeah. Uh, that already had a strong program. Um, they'd won the, the National Colleges League or Schools Cup that year. Uh, and I went over and, and did a, a session over there. I was impressed by the enthusiasm of the girls and, and the, the staff that were there. The, the outgoing co coach, uh, Sharon Brown, he was going off to work for the FA. What she'd achieved there and built um, and the program they had and the facility, just thought, I thought, yeah, this is something I can work with. Yeah. Um, it was 13 miles away from my house, not too far, but I hadn't taken into account the infamous Blackwall Tunnel. Um, but yeah, at that time it was okay. So I did that for 13 months. Again, re re won the the school's trophy, the college premier cup, and we also won the league. Um, went over to the states a couple of times on showcase tournaments. Had a real great time with them. A good bunch of girls, and it's quite sad to say goodbye to them. But it, it was one of those where I'd reached that stage where I just felt that was the time. Just go wind back a bit to the Watford experience. No, it didn't end great there, but just because obviously I was lucky enough to come and help you out a little bit there as well. It's quite. It was, I found that quite an, an intimidating environment to come into because the first time I'd worked with uh, women's a football team, mm -hmm. so I didn't really know, you know, in terms of 
you know how to act you know what that and then they just end up taking the mickey out of me great and, it's, and you realize the band is just the same it is with the men's team yeah but, i mean what did what did you um what was it like being back i mean i remember coming to some games and you know that being back and the the excitement the energy of match day at that level was you know did, was that was a bit like a drug for you getting back into that yeah i mean of course i get a little bit of that at car shorten but um yeah that at that point um I, I, I love being involved on the touchline uh, and again you watch so is it a different character on the touchline I don't know I don't think so I think again you learn from all your experiences and obviously my experience even at national team level meant that I approach games and preparation and match day stuff maybe differently to when I was back at Charlton um, yeah I loved it I, again I had a good group of players you know you work with them yeah, and again that's a, an environment that you generate that you mm. build and players come in knowing what my expectations are, what my demands are, what my philosophies and principles are. And they all bought into that very quickly. Mm. Uh, and I felt I had a really respectful bunch and, and a, a great group, as you found when you came down. They would never, yeah, they had the banter with you, but yeah. they also respected you. Yeah, yeah. And I know that they enjoyed what we did. And again, you know, I, as you know, at the time, I felt there's a place for that. And again, we had the luxury then of the three nights training, so we could slot that session in. Yeah. Um, and it fitted nicely into what we did and uh, and I know the girls benefited from it because you could see it you know when mm. you can see results of work on a match day yeah. whether it's individual skills or whether it's in, in team cohesion you know that's a result of your methodology whether it's you doing the coaching and whether it's people you bring in mm. and I always felt that I brought in the right staff wherever I've gone I always feel that I've managed to recruit and enlist the right staff and and again I've never called them absolutely that my staff I've always used the word colleagues so anybody that's ever come in and worked with me I see them on the same level I don't yeah you might be the head coach you might be this but even the guy I'm working with now at Carl Shorten he's the player manager but we work alongside each other mm. uh, he never talks down to me although he's a, a foot taller mm. um, but he's got so much respect for me but it's a mutual thing and I think you have to have that between you and your staff you, know, you should never see staff as a uh, again as a weak a weaker area and if you're employing staff that are that much weaker than you that that for me means you're almost fearful mm. that they're going to question you I want my staff to question me I, I want them to tell me if they think I've made the wrong choice I still might make it because that's my my role but I, I want people to challenge me uh, and I want people that I can bounce off of as well and, mm. and sit and have a discussion about and tell me where I went wrong um, it's no good having people that are too shy to do that. So. But it's, it's quite a unique environment. What I noticed straight away is that you've got the older players who have, you know, the 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 the, the uh, been a, the seasoned professionals, if you like, have been around there for a long time, and then the younger, more eager, and it, it was juggling that dynamic, which was really interesting for me. And then there's different personalities and trying to motivate different players, mm -hmm. and some players obviously weren't particularly buying into some things, and some were, you know. How do you how do you juggle that? And because obviously it's really different to coach the barking happy girls different you know different issues solutions or problems whatever again, I mean, we that's talking about it earlier again the the, yeah. the world's all gummy syndrome it's knowing which head to put on and, and again cool again that's where experience does come into it so and that again goes back to our earlier discussions about jumping through your badges you've got to gain the experience by doing it and and again I know I've learned from every single experience and I have had the pleasure of working with high level pros down to the to the the lowest level and you kind of you take chunks out of everything and when you're in that environment you try and piece it together I mean you had the luxury of working with with Wardy who's a fabulous pro yeah. uh, and her mentality even with the kids now because she's still the senior player there the yeah. team's still going but she's kind of a grandmother in that team I hope she don't listen to me and get insulted <laughs> by it but um, yeah she's had to deal with that but she's a fabulous character and she's yeah. done that and she's a mother herself so she's almost mothered the team not grandmother I'll say mother Wardy not grandmother in case you're listening <laughs> But um, yeah, you've got again. You've got again. Recognise your 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 leaders in the team. Your and then you use them. You kind of bring them in. You know, let's call it into uh, meet the parents into your circle, and you kind of encourage them to be a part of your your coaching team. Mm. And and they can then go and and they can be your peers. So they're your peer pressure workers on the younger kids. So you don't want to have to keep putting a young player in and saying this 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 and this. Yeah. You go. Wardy, you going to have a chat with her because she'll respect you. So again, you're not automatically um, due that respect from every player. You have to earn it, and it's a two-way thing, as you know. Yeah. So in the meantime, 
can you use maybe another individual within your group that they will listen to and they will respect and that could be another coach it could be a player it could be a, a, another member of staff in another capacity but somebody that they'll listen to and there's always someone that they'll listen to even if just for the sake that they want to annoy you by saying well I'm going to do what they said but yeah. not because you told me so again it's working that out it's, it takes some cleverness but again it, it, it comes from experience in it and, and I've certainly experienced it I suppose now that you know talk about Wardy being there the mother, the grandmother, the, the mm. uh, her team, but you're like the father or grandfather of you know the women's game almost. It's almost you have, you've, you've uh, had so much influence over coaches and, and players. I mean, I'll show you then that that you know we we just had this chat that when we when we won the games I was at and one of another one of your proteges was playing against you was the manager of the other team and it's almost like you know right I've got to beat Keith you know Keith mm. it's almost like you know every week you're playing against someone who's that's happened to me now at semi pro level in a men's game as well so many ex-students are managing other yeah. teams uh, and it, yeah it does put pressure on on the, the team that I'm coaching to a certain extent but it is again it's it's humbling for me um, that they feel that way but they'll also come up and, and and if you like the hugs you get after the game and the handshakes are genuine mm. and the discussions you have are always respectful and you know if they've beaten us they get that full respect from me um, but hasn't happened that many times but, uh, yeah so certainly in the women's game players in other teams as well that played for me in the past you, you never lose touch even now I go around watching some of the women's games as well so I went to watch Charlton Man United the other, the other week so Casey obviously managing yeah. Manchester United now highly successful we have a really good chat before the game um, but probably six or seven of the Charlton girls I coached either at one club or when they were kids at Charlton wow. and they come up to me their parents come up to me uh, when are you coming back? When are you coming back into the women's game? When are you going to be managing the team again? I want to play for you again. And I get those kind of messages on a daily basis. You know, Mez, uh, Merrick, Will yeah. keeps in touch all the time. You know, I'll, there's a coaching job going at this club. Are you going to take it? I want to come and play for you again. Those are massive kind of um, plus factors. And again, so, so what do you say then? When are you going to get back into? Would you like to get back into the to, to management? I did a recent. Uh, interview for the South London Press I'm sorry I keep right. my that exists there um, and one question he asked was that does that mean it's the end of you being the manager the head coach if you like rather than the number two and my answer is never say never um, but I've kind of said to myself I don't want to go through any drawn out application processes so I'm not going to go I won't say begging but I'm not going to go saying please give me this job yeah um, he put a big headline on the article saying um, that I'm still available in a nutshell I yeah. can show you the, the, the paper when we go out um, I've still got it but it was like no if, if somebody came to me with the right and it's not the financial offer I can assure you of that it's got nothing to do with the financial offer it's got to be the right opportunity yeah. um, to be back on the touchline and, and being yeah being the decision maker, uh, yeah, I'll never lose that adrenaline rush. Did you miss that day in day out with yeah. the with the with the players? And I'm missing it right now. Yeah. Um, if I'm honest, as we said earlier, because uh, it, it is your buzz. You know, I want to be on the old saying on the grass, if you like, and no, I can't run anymore. The legs are, are, are properly knackered, but the brain's still working. Uh, the enthusiasm's still there. I think the knowledge is definitely there uh, and I know how to use uh, uh, the player method now for demonstrations if I have to. I can still do a walkthrough, um, I can certainly still paint the picture. You know, I always remember watching Dave Sexton many, many years ago at Wembley doing a session when he, he'd had a triple heart bypass and obviously couldn't run but he just pointed and cajoled and the players did exactly what he wanted them to do um, because they hung on his every word and he knew what he was saying and they believed in what he was saying. So I think as long as you can do that, um, great if you're still mobile and you can still demo like you do in your role. Um, but then I can always use you, see? So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've, listen, I've built so many friendships and relationships with IE students like yourself that I don't call students anymore. You know, people ask me, yes, as an ex-student, but you know, you're a friend and you're a colleague. Um, lads like Pete Augustine at Surrey, uh, CCD in Surrey now, started his level two with me. Um, level three went through again nervous wreck 
and, and got him through that. And, and even Casey started a badges with me, did a two and a, and a level three with me. And, and as again, again, going through her A license, oh, I've got my, my final assessment. And other people that have contacted me, can you, can you help me with my session? I never say no. Mm. Um, and, and like I said, I've got this one in 10 rule that my mum taught me that if one in 10 appreciates it and, and, and benefits from it, um, you're always going to get those that forget and those that go on a different career path or a different mindset for whatever reason. And that's definitely happened to me. Uh, and I don't understand it, but I accept that that's part of human nature. Uh, for some, for whatever reason, people do that, um, and it won't stop me helping people in future. It won't stop. So what me you, you mean that people this. maybe don't not value in the the input you've given them, the support. You I give think them. They, some people have valued it at the time, um, but then they've gone on to be successful, or they've gone on to be different people, or gone into different roles, and then they lose touch, or literally going completely the opposite direction even if you try and try and touch base with them or work with them uh, they basically blank you or they they, they turn it away mm. and yeah I found I found that really strange with 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 a, a very small group of people um, but you know I, 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 I get angry uh, and upset but I can't let that last because there's there's bigger priorities in life as we spoke about earlier so um, if that's the way they want to be, that's the way they want to go. Then you know they're the ones that have to look in a mirror. Um, if it, if it's if it's that way, but I'm more enthused by the amount of people that that have constantly kept in touch. I keep a lot of the letters, a lot of the messages that I get. I do. I copy and paste them. I've got them in testimonials on on my computer and my hard drive. So when I'm feeling a little bit cheesed off with things, I can just look through those and go, wow. You know, I I help that person do that. I help that person do that. You know, and it even goes as far as the people saying that you changed my life mm. um, for the better, and you've had a, that much of an influence on me. And if it wasn't for you, those kind of sentences are actually quite strong. Mm. Um, so those are the ones that um, will make sure that I never stop uh, helping people if they ask for it. Uh, even though, like I said, sometimes Kopi will say, "Why do you do it?" Uh, and just as lastly, I just want to interest because you, you talked about you're, 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 you're working at Cole Shorten now, men's mm -hmm. in that non league environment. Uh, what's just what's that like? I mean, in terms of like, what's the difference between working with those guys and then with the work we worked with the Cholton or the, or the Watford ladies? I mean, what, what's the main contrast and differences and challenges? <laughs> as I said, going back in the day, Tootin and Mitchell was my first role in the yeah. Ryman, Ryman second division, so uh, that was the step up into that non league. Uh, environment where everyone's playing for an envelope uh, so you get a mixture of young players that are still hoping that one day they're going to get the break older players that are relying on the money uh, to, to put towards their mortgage and some that, that you know without a doubt you'd have to call mercenaries that are in it for a, as much money as they can get but they're not actually going out and don't really care about the club they're playing for um, I think I changed that culture at Tooting. I, again, I had a great team. Uh, when we won the league, it was a fabulous team, a, a group of players from uh, the captain downwards. Uh, and, and sadly, we, we lost one of them a couple of years back to motor neurone disease. Um, but the team had a reunion recently and, and we, we all keep in touch. And um, So again, that's a legacy that stayed in place from the culture that was created. Um, and I think being at Carl Shorten, as I said, the player manager is a real, uh, a real strong character and commands a great deal of respect from the players. Not because he's uh, aggressive, but because he's <coughs> that type of individual. Yeah, he's uh, he's honest, he's straight uh, down the middle with them when he's speaking. Um, he won't accept uh, any kind of nonsense, you know, disruption. He won't accept. Uh, a negative influence in the dressing room. When he walks in the dressing room on match days before the game, the room drops silent. So they'll have the music blaring, they'll be dancing, talking, da -da. but as soon as he walks in, music's off, the room goes dead silent. And he's a very quiet speaker. And, and the way the dressing rooms are designed at Carl Shorten, there's kind of a corridor off the main dressing room, it's not that big. And, and I kind of sit around the corner, and sometimes when he's speaking, I can't hear him. 
because he speaks so softly. And at the end of the speech, he says, right, Keith, you got anything to add? I said, well, I didn't hear what you said, so <laughs> I don't know what to add. Um, but we really bounce well off of each other. He's learning from me, and I'm learning from him, um, although he won't realise that. Um, but I'm amazed by his characteristics. It, it never ceases to uh, to get me thinking. Um, what's, what that, look, what's that dynamic? Because I'm just, because I'm reflecting, obviously, uh, well, we spent a bit of time with you when you were at Watford. Yeah. You were head, you you working with Albert under yeah. underneath who's your assistant. Well, Albert coach. was working with me again. Um, ironically, he's the goalkeeping coach with us now. Yeah. So Albert, who's who's another long time uh, yeah. junior, who's working with you. So you know he was this he was the assistant. You're the boss, and then now you're the, you're the assistant, and that's the boss or the colleague you call that. What's that different dynamic like in terms of you know there's a little bit is that a little bit less pressure on me in the sense because we've got again a, we've had a successful. Uh, two seasons and obviously you know when you're in you're being successful the competition for places stays high and when a player's not playing more so than when you're not successful um, the players that are not playing are even more upset uh, and harder to manage well Pete has to deal with that and I do I do help I do speak to players because they they call me uh, separately and ask me about their game and if they've been dropped, uh, they ask me, what did I do wrong? Yeah. Um, but I always let Pete know whatever I've said uh, and however I've fed back to him. And I'm always honest in my feedback, he knows that. Um, it's not as stressful. I still get stressed in the dugout because Pete is a player manager. Sometimes he's playing, so I have to assume the role uh, in the technical area. Uh, and the last couple of games again you know there's certain points in the game where I can feel the chest tightening up and I'm thinking oh, you start you feel the anxiety mm. you can't help that uh, because you want the team to be successful uh, how do you do that in terms real... of say if he's playing and then you're taking responsibility I mean you've, you've had a discussion beforehand but you've, you've actually got to make decisions on the on whether, the, whether on he's the... playing or not um, the way we work it especially at home I always sit in the stand in the first half even if he's playing so Alberto will be in the technical area in the first half we very rarely would make substitutions in the first half okay. anyway unless there was an injury or yeah. something really going drastically wrong so I sit up in the stand and I take notes half time players go into the dressing room myself and Pete and Albert will stand outside for a little while and we'll look at the notes we'll discuss what's gone on if he's playing how did it feel inside the team which yeah. can be an advantage if he's not playing, then it's what did he see from the technical area, what did I see from up there? And then you marry the two, yeah. and then you're thinking about, okay, we're gonna now go in and make these points. What that also does is allow that three to five minute period where the players have gone in and had their say between themselves. Okay. I think that works really well. Um, from my, my angle, it certainly does. And again, when we walk in, they then shut up. So they've had their little chips at each other or discussions about what's gone on positives or whatever and when we walk in they know now that's our time then but that's quite an, that's a, quite a skill in itself isn't yep. it managing the half time absolutely I found it might pass with steam in there you talk and then you've got no. another 10 minutes left you're like well well, well we, we, hear a lot, we hear a lot <laughs> of the opponents doing that and it kind of makes us chuckle um, and it happened on on Saturday ironically uh, half time and after the game so yeah people walk in silence these are the points bum 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 if we're going to make changes, this is what we're going to do. And then he'll just say to me at the end, have I missed anything? So from the notes that I've given, if he hasn't said it, then I'll just add that on the end. And, and do you have and the Keith Boanis hair dryer come out ever and uh, have a little blast? It's, <laughs> I, not to that extent. It's, it's happened a couple of times where the performances were so bad. I think once last year and once this year, uh, where the, deform the performance dipped well below the levels that we accept. So we then made a conscious decision, or Pete makes a conscious decision, not to speak. He can't, because if he goes, I haven't seen it, but apparently if he does go, uh, it's like a volcano erupting. But I've not seen it. So rather than do that, he says, I'm not going to say anything. So he kind of controlled himself by saying, I've got nothing to say. Keith, can you take it? So then, yeah, I've hit him, <coughs> but not chucking things about. I've not then, kicking the boot across the room. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I've, the worst I've ever done is throw a book down on a, on a, but not in this team. In the past, even I could tell you a story about Tuna Mitchum back in the day, but that's an <laughs> old one. But in this club, no. Um, but, but then I let them know the truth, and I'll tell them individually yeah. as well. I was in a girls' dressing room. Going back to that, 
you don't ever criticise an individual um, in front of her teammates. In a men's dressing room, you can do that. In a girls' dressing room, very difficult unless you know the character can take it. But you'd never take that risk if you weren't one hundred percent sure of that. So why is that? Just because it's uh, because of the emotional mostly. side of it. Okay. And, and anyone can challenge me on this if they're listening. Um, if 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 you criticise that one player, uh, you probably lose her for six months because she'll feel that you've shown her up in front of her teammates, and her teammates will feel sorry for her as well. Right. Um, so you get this kind of domino effect. Yeah. And it's likewise if you praise only one player and not the rest. Then the favouritism thing kicks in. Um, I'm not saying it's across the board, but certainly in my experience, it's, it's, mm. it's the truth. Um, it's, it's another thing that Anson Dorrance spoke about back when I went to that that uh, conference that he did. But in a men's restaurant, obviously, you can go, well, you were this today, and you were that today, and you didn't do this, and you didn't do that. And they'll kind of take it on the chin, or they'll come back at you, but then you go out and it's forgotten. Some things you could say in a girl's restaurant may not be forgotten. Mm. And I think some coaches have suffered because they've said things in the girls dressing room and it's come back to bite them on the backside for yeah. want of a better way of putting it um, in fact I know that for a fact yeah but a two in the worst scenario once was a, I, I did have an air dryer moment and the players were sitting eating there at that time sandwiches and whatever sausage rolls whatever it was at two in back in the day and I literally told them they're not getting their money Oh, I had them money, and I and I actually doused some envelopes with uh, lighter fluid, and I lit the envelopes because it was a concrete floor, and the, the money wasn't in the envelopes, but they didn't know that. <laughs> and then I went to go out the dressing room, and the handle come off in the hand. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get out the dressing room. So still your and I turned around, said, "One of you laughs." <laughs> they're all like choking on their food and uh, and all sorts. Right, so yeah. Keith, I'm gonna let you go because I know you're a busy man. You've got your many hats to put on. So thanks very much. Appreciate your time. It's been fantastic. You're welcome. I hope uh, I hope it's insightful, and I hope some some people, some listeners, enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.